So with Koa, which is one of our most popular series on the upper end, it has a great story to it before you've even bought it. It has to be naturally down. It has to grow above 5,000 feet in elevation. Uh, it has to be on private property. It's bought blind, so every log you can't see within it to see what it's going to figure like. In regards to the figure, it has to grow above 5,000 feet in elevation for it to actually figure like this. Otherwise, it would look just flat, orange. And every log that we buy is a quarter million dollars. Holy right? And we buy them from a very private uh, plantation owner on the big island of Hawaii. That's the only island that it comes from. So now you've really focused this entire species down to one little speck on the map. Now, koa is one of the most prominent tone woods that you buy with these. Because you're never really going to come into a guitar studio looking to buy a rosewood spruce and turn around and walk out with a Koa guitar. It usually doesn't happen that way, okay? That's like going in to buy a truck and you walk out with a Fiat or something weird, right? Ford, Ford Flex or, I don't know, I'll work on that joke. <laughs> now, the cool thing about Koa is that it, it has kind of this real weird composition. It, it loves that mid-range of mahogany, but it also kind of bears some of that top-end sizzle that maple has. The cool part about it is, is that as it ages, it gathers all this bass. So the guitar gets a little sticky and a little bright out of the gate, but the longer you own it and the more you play it, the warmer it gets. It also starts to get a little bit more orange than this, which is really cool. and it's not traditional. That's the one thing I cannot stress enough is that Taylor is not traditional. This is a modern view of what we think an acoustic guitar should be. Okay. So What's that, interesting real quick about the Koa is that he was saying they have to buy the, the log blind. And what he's saying is that they don't get to cut into it to see what that is going to look like. So when they get that log, they're writing a quarter of a million dollar check and they have no idea what it's going to be. Now, granted, they know how to use an altimeter and they know what to look for and most of the time they're correct. Every now and again, they will get a log that does that, right? And there's a really simple way. If you guys ever want to know if you've got a bad log, if you see an influx of ukuleles in your local music store, <laughs> <laughs> it's noteworthy. Yeah, I mean, and just to bring it down to ground level, I mean, that would be like going to the grocery store, picking up a loaf of bread, not being able to see it, and then know that every loaf, or excuse me, every slice in the loaf is going to look different, taste different. You probably just put it back and move on to something else. Uh, and a cool story just from the inside, you know, we, when we look at raw lumber, koa specifically, you know, you can't see what the grain looks like from that three-dimensional perspective. You know, most grain runs north to south with the strings. And most people never really think about that. But when you look at a top, the strings run congruent with the grain. We've tried to build it the other way. The, the wood won't move the way it's supposed to move, and that's a really interesting thought. Bob actually brought that to my attention. But when you start to see really exotic timber that has what we call medullary ray, that's when it starts to 3D like go east to west. And you can't see that when it's at its very raw state. So what we do is, it's called the water test. We actually spray water on it in the factory to see how good it's going to look when we gloss it. And that kind of den denotes what series it's going to be in. If we run out of water, we use spit. <laughs> my mom came into the factory and I told her about that. She goes, can I spit on that one? I'm like, okay. Up and she's like, somebody's gonna have my spit on your next guitar. <laughs> so, are there any questions about just tone with the jump? This group knows a lot. Yes? How many, how many guitars do you have uh, total strings? It's a on great average. It's uh, a great question. Let me paint the picture for you. Um, the majority of logs that you see that we use as guitar makers, whether it be mahogany, rosewood, koa, walnut, maple, these trees are standing probably 10 foot in diameter, and they're probably 70 to 80 feet long. Now a really nice log stands, you know, 10 foot in diameter at the base, and eight foot in diameter at the tip. You know, we're looking for trees that are straight and round. We're not looking for the ones where they're 10 foot on one end, and they're 
forefoot on the other because then you've only got so much space before an actual set won't fit. To give you a ballpark number, when you buy a 200-year-old tree, uh, it could be anywhere from 400 to 2,000 sets. It really depends. It really depends. Um, so with all due respect to the tree, I mean, we hope we can get as much out of it as we can. And just so I can highlight that, that issue with Taylor, I mean, we are an extremely green company, down to the point where we're recycling the rubbing compound that comes off the buffing wheel. Okay? Everything else is scrap dusted and sold back for particle board, for mulch, uh, what have you, or it's set off for firewood for the employees. Like it really gets cold in San Diego. Great question. Yes? I was surprised when you said that the top is just migrating in all different directions. I kind of assumed it was going in and out. Do you, do you look at it under a stove or something like that to make it do that? That's a great question. I'm going to answer that in just one second because it's worth highlighting. I'll get back to that in one second. Yes? Are you prepared to start being 100% in the United States or are parts of it built somewhere else? It's a great question. The question is what parts, if any, are United States made versus uh, outside? First, I would tell you that we make all the tools that build all the machines and the robotics that build all the guitars. The only thing that we personally do not make is the strings, which come from Elixir, the fret wire, which is a Dunlop 6160 style, um, and the tuners, for the most part. They're either going to be Godos or they're going to be pink. Everything else is done in-house. Now, if it's a laminate series guitar, which in our opinion is a 200 series or below, so baby, big baby, GS minis, 100s and 200s, those are all built in Takati, Mexico. That's our folks, our machines, the majority of those guitar parts are actually built in San Diego and then sent down there. And everything all solid, all the way up through the electrics, the custom shop, is all uh, done in El Cajon. As a crow flies, how far is Takati from here? About 30 miles from the shop, you can see it from where we're at. Yes? Yeah, it's definitely, it comes up every night. Um, Brazilian, everybody wants what they can't have. It's the nature of the human being. But it's also the availability of it, which is what drives the price on Brazilian, okay? You cannot buy new Brazilian rosewood guitars today for less than, I would say, modestly, about 15,000, okay? Brazilian has not been shipped into the United States since 1969, so if anybody has it, They've already had to have it since then, or something of the like. Uh, Brazilian, when you smell it in its very rawest form, it has a very peppery kind of fragrance to it. It's very organic smelling. So when you put it up to your face, you can smell the difference. Uh, it has a very interesting look to it. Uh, sometimes it's very straight grain. Sometimes it's very swirly, depending on how you cut it. Uh, but even Bob Taylor would tell you, if you can't hear the difference between a guitar that's 15 gram and 2,500, don't spend the money. Okay? Unless you've got more money than you know what to do with, and you're putting it away as an investment. This is art. Okay, so art is appreciated. <laughs> Classic vehicles, paintings, guitars. It's one of those things we'll appreciate over time. With Brazilian, it's can you get the right piece? Can you get it for the price that you want? And what do you plan on doing with it? It's a collector's thing or what have you. Um, yes, we do have quite a few sets of Brazilian in stock. No, it is not available at this point in time because we're just kind of taking it off the market just to kind of keep it safe, so to speak. We don't really want to get rid of it at this point. Um, it's got a really nice, sweet, low mid-range to it. Indian rosewood, much chocolatey, much more dominant on that base. And if you want something that's very similar to it, sonically, Madagascar rosewood. It's almost identical. Yes?
so much uh, attention on the legality of wood and, and the, the movement of certain species within and out of certain countries. So we would always tell you that no matter what you're doing, you have to be very careful where you're going, uh, and you have to prepare yourself because it is a it is a fire and risk type of, of situation at times. Yeah. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Nixon was just raided a couple weeks ago yeah. for using illegal wood. I heard about that. Was it bad? Yeah. come up every night since. Let me just, I'm going to make one statement about this particular topic and I'm really not going to take any questions on it because this is, this is something that's very personal to the guitar making community. The first thing I'll say is that Gibson is one of the most important guitar makers on the planet. And if there's anything that's going to happen to that company, it would be detrimental to everybody. Okay? They're, they make what is a very healthy guitar community and they really strive to make beautiful guitars and they've done that for a long time. The last thing I'll say is that there's a lot of what have you that haven't been really released and, un and un uh, disclosed and uncovered with this entire uh, thing. And we're all just kind of waiting to see how it's going to shake out. That's pretty much the deal. But anything that you've really heard is there's a lot of things that are going around in the air right now. And I wouldn't believe any one thing until it finally settles and hits the floor. Okay? But we're, we're rooting for the best possible outcome and we want Gibson to be as healthy and as strong and as vibrant as they can too. Yes? Are you still getting any Tasmanian blackwood? Mm, you know, we're seasoning some right now. You know, it's uh, it's been off the menu now for two years because we just haven't had it. We just have, it's great. You know, it's a it's the cousin of koa. It's what koa looks like if it doesn't grow above five thousand feet. Yes, sir. I've got a guitar that has Malaysian blackwood on it. Sorry. What would that be? Somebody be in home because it's a really sweet guitar. I can't answer. Based on what you've heard tonight, you've heard a little bit of that crispiness, you've heard a little bit of that low end timbre. Yeah, it, it, it would be fitted somewhere in between. It is somewhere in between. Sure. <coughs> so this is the one, if you're really a cheapskate, you can get for half price. <laughs> it's also I mean, that's the one for me. It's right. exceptional open tunings, right? Open tunings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really <laughs> seasoned. It's opened up a tremendous amount here. Uh, this is what we call the Naked Guitar, the extra edition vehicle here. This has been out on the road with me since 2006, so there are some updates to it that I speak to. Uh, but just for general purposes, this is this guitar. This is the GS8. It's the same guitar. I own one of these myself. But now you can see what it looks like without anything on the back. It's a completely finished guitar, too, which is why it makes it so very expensive when you can't buy it yourself. A couple years back, we, uh, we got a phone call from a really nerdy group of scientists at Purdue. And I say this with bated breath because two years ago I said that same statement at Elder Instruments in uh, Michigan, and the woman who was the wife of that scientist was in the audience. <laughs> uh, that worked out great. <laughs> I bought her name. She probably agreed with me. <laughs> Bob, right? So what they, what they said is, they said, hey, Bob Taylor, do you want to know why guitars make noise? Bob's like, well, I've built some guitars since I was 14 years old. I've got an idea. Why don't you come out and enlighten them? So we brought them out. They hung a guitar in free suspension. They fired every piece of gadgetry known to a scientist with this thing to figure out what exactly is happening with not just a Taylor acoustic, but an acoustic guitar in general. And they came up with two very important things. The first is that when a note actually blooms, and it decays, those frequencies dissipate clockwise. That's why guitars are bridged the way they do. That's why we put our body sensing and our electronics on the guitar the way we do. Yeah. So that, to really break that down to the most lay terms, everything ends <coughs> right here. Okay? It's easy to think about it that way. Everything kind of comes back to home. The second thing we realize is that the amount of wood that my hand covers right here is the amount of wood that you just bought that's moving on a traditional acoustic guitar. And I told you already earlier that that's 90% of what I'm hearing, well now I'm getting this much of 90%. And the reason being is because the bracing on this side and the lining, which is what gives the ability to hold the sides to the top of the neck, is so tight, it doesn't allow the periphery to really go anywhere. You get no sonic excitement from the sides of this, of this tone board. Okay? So what Taylor does, and he got this idea from a really high-end violin maker, is that from the waist all the way down on the other side, the other side of the waist here, against the top of the pattern here. There's a relief wrap that we cut. So we cut a groove on the top, thins it out towards the side. So now what happens is that you get, a, you get the opportunity to essentially double the amount of flexible surface area. Okay, well, what does that mean? I got a jump up. Taylor ever made of his GS Mini. And 
definitely highlights kind of what a relief crowd is capable of doing. When I've got a guitar, so what I can do is move the volume is really low. That was the point. But you know, we always have a snap to these lives. You know what, adding really quick to what Mike was saying about this being the area that's moving, that also really lends a lot of credibility to the fact that the cutaway is not going to affect the sound. The brace that you can see behind the cutaway, as well as on the cutaway that just comes up you know, and adjusts a little bit. You know, if you find a guitar that sounds great and you love it, have the cutaway, you know, the cutaway is live to this. The last thing that this is really good to show you is that you know, we talked earlier about the, that PHD in neck design. Right? I'll show you what it looks like. You know, we've done these restring clearance before where we go and do neck resets and restrings and cover and everything with the guitar stack to square one. And <clears throat> my first trip with Taylor in 06, we were in Littleton, New Hampshire. A woman's guitar on the counter and we needed to do a neck reset. Well, that requires taking the neck off. So we went and we popped the neck off. And she just started crying. <laughs> <laughs> because she didn't realize that there's no glue. And that we had broken it. So, first, on the body of the instrument. On the front. On the top. This is the pocket. In these pockets, mine are glued in. These are shims. We mill them from leftover scraps from our 100 series back to size. And we taper them to one side. So when your guitar needs to be adjusted, we can just literally take the neck off and we can rock it. We can tilt it. That differs tremendously. It's been the traditional way of putting a neck on a guitar for the last 100 plus years. The dovetail joint has air gap. They put air gap between the two walls so that there's dead space, so that no air can actually uh, move, so no sound can penetrate. We don't want that. We want a flush wood-to-wood -wood contact. Okay? The second thing is, is that there is a fulcrum point on an acoustic guitar. It's called the 14th fret. You look at your guitar, it's right where that neck meets the body. And that's where there's going to be the most stress on any acoustic guitar. So what we do is our or excuse me, our truss rod runs from the neck to the octave tongue floats. So as your guitar is rolling, so is the neck not holding it back. Okay? And it also helps if you're not manipulating the humidity level. Finally, the neck itself is five pieces. Because anytime you make a cut to a piece of log that's going to become a neck, it's going to move. And a neck needs to be started about eight weeks before the guitar body is started. So we're going to cut it about 20 times. And every time you move it, it twists. The last thing you want to do is sell you a gorgeous one of a kind five thousand dollar guitar and you get home and eight weeks later your neck is twisted. All right? We hope we took that out for you. It's like pre star shirts. So we have the heel, we have the shaft, we've got the headstock, we've got the fretboard, and we've got the peg head to neck. Okay? Other questions? What he's referring to, if you don't know the terminology, is that the distance between the nut and the saddle is what we call the scale length. Okay? On a standard guitar, anything acoustic that's not a grand concert or, or a small body is, is going to be 25 and a half inches. Short scale, which would be anything that's in the electric world, like the T5s, the T3s, the stuff, the solid bodies, or anything grand concert. Those are going to be short scale. That's going to be 24 and 7 eighths inches. Essentially, what that means is, and, and you, here's how you know if this is a good idea for you. You say to yourself, I got small hands. I hear that all the time in the show. I got really small hands. It's hard for me to make these real big chordal stretch. Okay. Well, what happens is when you kind of bring those nut and saddle closer together, now the frets get a little closer. Now all of a sudden you've got this real ease of play. So anything electric and anything grand concert is going to be short scale. Great question. Had one over here. That's correct. That's correct. On the acoustic world, there's three bolts. On the electric world, there's one. It's called a T-lock joint. 
it looks kind of like this. So the body receives, the neck kind of gives, and as you turn that one bolt, it drives the neck into the body. It's stronger than the equivalency of 10 strap bolts. We've broken a lot of straps to figure that out. <laughs> Anyone else? It's the other way around because the bracing pattern reverses. Unless you're standing on your head against the south of the equator. Or reverse. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Because of the tension from treble side to bass side. I've seen some guitars with a sound hole on the side. That's just a static or pretty much? Or? This came up last night. The gentleman that, that uh, asked the question didn't pose it as eloquently as you did. <laughs> the question is, what, is what you're, I think what you're referring to is a McPherson. So that's something that people may know already about. Here's the thing, let me, I mean, we can go all day, and I know we want to get on and, and listen and do some guitar playing, but there's a specific reason for the sound hole other than just for the guitar to breathe. And if you really want to get geeky, here you go, okay? The sound hole is basically like the blowhole of oil. As soon as I actually strum a chord, what happens, even though I can't physically see it, it's there. There's a circular sound wave that comes out of that guitar. It comes out about three feet. After about three feet, that sound wave turns flat and dissipates in about a tenth of space. Okay? That's the key when we would tell somebody that um, a great guitar sounds just as good from ten feet as it does from three. And that's the other reason that you should always think about buying a completely all solid wood guitar because a laminate back does not have that capability to help throw that um, dynamic range that far and that wide and with that same fidelity. As soon as you move that sound hole somewhere else, you're changing a great deal of, of the geometry of that instrument. From a McPherson standpoint, personally, because I know I'm on camera here, my personal thought is, is that that is more of a port than a sound hole. It's, desi it's designed to direct sound to my face than it is to the direction that the instrument is supposed to be making noise. You know, great acoustic guitars will sound at its optimum level at a 45 degree angle from the sound hole. So that's typically why when I'm trying to mic, it's coming at me towards the bridge. Um, and you'll notice in a studio scenario that the mics are typically at a 45 and then you've got a 10 foot mic somewhere else to capture the ambience. Sound holes from a Martin to a Taylor to a Gibson to a Froggy Bottom, Sussan Dong, Collins, Santa Cruz, Olsen, Ryan, they're all about four and a quarter inches. It's a pretty standard scenario because you as a guitar player, you've already figured out what an acoustic is supposed to sound like. You have some idea what this guitar is going to sound like before you even strum it, because it looks normal to you. And that's an inherent thing that's become just part of a, an acoustic guitar effect. It's a great question. Sorry, I over, I kind of overkill that one. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. Yes? Can you just give us a quick take on how critical it is to humidify your guitar? Mm -hmm. And especially in the Midwest, we're all over the board. We're lots of humidity in the summer and none in the winter. You don't have that. I and scratch my head at what you guys are doing out here in January. And what, and what do you rec what's your best recommendation for how to do it? No problem. All right, this is the last thing I'll say before we turn it over to Mark, but this is maybe the most important thing that I'll say of the night. You would never go out and buy a brand new car and never put an oil change on it for the rest of its days. You would never not protect your investment. You would never not put insurance on your home or your jewelry or the guitars that you find valuable now. Humidity is the utmost important thing that you can do after you've actually made the ultimate decision on which guitar is right for you. Okay? It's not very expensive to do, but it's paramount. Guitars have about a 6 to 8% water content value once they're built. A tree is about 30%. So what we do at Taylor is we dry out wood as hard as we can because what happens is once you break a certain point of moisture content inside a piece of wood, you start to break down water that's already inside the fiber of the wood, not just between the wood cells. So we take it all the way down to the ground and then we slowly rehumidify it so that it stabilizes. Essentially what we do is we temper it. That way when you're not being able to control the humidity as best you can, all of a sudden you're at a little bit less risk than something else. Let's get to the point. In wherever you keep your guitars, you should be shooting for a 50% relative humidity in that space. And I guarantee you there's nobody in this room that can tell me right now what the humidity level is in this room or in the room of their home.
wrong unless you're looking at your hydrometer. And you're usually about 20% higher than you think. So, for folks in the Midwest, and believe me, I used to do the Southeast. I had South Carolina. Brutal. You ever been to South Carolina in July? You have not lived. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, first Taylor Roadshow I have attended. I'm comparing it with roadshows from other manufacturers. I enjoyed this one a lot because they had a much wider range of guitars than I'm used to seeing and very accomplished musicians. Some of the others have accomplished musicians, but these had a special affinity for their instruments.